So hi everybody, my name is Rahul. I'm the CTO of TypeLead. And TypeLead is a company that's working on building a programming language called Ida, which uh, is based on Haskell and runs on top of the J Java Virtual Machine. So today, I'm going to talk about something we've been working on recently, which is a way, another way to work with concurrency on the JVM. There's already, there's some uh, existing libraries and frameworks that solve a similar problem, but we're going to show why the way we're doing it is much more powerful. Okay, so just a bit uh, of an overview of this project. It started out uh, with the name GHCVM uh, last year uh, as part of a Haskell Summer of Code project, and my mentor was Edward Kmet. And uh, so soon, after this pro uh, soon after the summer ended, I really wanted to continue working on this. I saw a huge future in it. This response was great from lots of people on Twitter. And uh, so what happened was my wife also saw how, uh, how much response this project was getting. And she decided she would also work full time with me on this and make it a success. So that, that's when we started TypeLead, which is a company that uh, takes it forward. And we also decided to give it a better name. GHCVM is like a very lame name. So uh, we decided to call it Ida. And just recently, we got uh, invested by uh, Techstars. Small investment, but it's enough to sustain us for quite a while. So uh, yeah, so we're in uh, New York for, for a couple months. So now let's just talk about Ida itself. What is it? It's a pure, lazy, statically typed language, and it runs on the JVM, as I said before. And it's a fork of GX, G at C. So what this means is, Ida actually has access to all the major type system features, it has access to all the major optimizations, it has access to the optimizer of G at C. But the only thing that changes is the backend, which is the part that generates the intermediate representations out of G at C into. Uh, Java bytecodes. So and another cool part about uh, this is that we can compile Haskell packages out of the box, which means uh, even though we haven't spent that much time on building libraries, we already have access to a bunch of them because ju just because of the fact that we s support the same syntax. And we also have a strongly typed FFI. So we have an FFI that lets you, um, so one of the tricky bits of having a pure language is you have to be able to uh, interact with impure and impure uh, ecosystem, in this case, the Java ecosystem. And you need to do it in a, in a way that doesn't break the purity, otherwise there's no point in using this language in the first place. So we have a really nice solution for that. I will not be talking about that uh, in this talk, uh, but you can find information about it online. And one of the main focuses of this project is it, ca it, it came out of burning need to want to use Haskell everywhere, like uh, in like at work and uh, in, in, in industry in general. So in order to do that, we need to one, focus on user experience, make it really, really awesome in terms of tooling, in terms of IDE support, all that has to be great. And we also have to focus a lot on performance, both compile time performance and runtime performance, both of which are important for using any technology in a business. So most of the talk today will be focused on ways you can do concurrency. We'll first start with uh, the ways you do concurrency in existing languages. We're, we'll probably be talking about J, other JVM languages, but it applies to languages in general. And we'll start with the definition from, that I took from Wikipedia of what concurrency actually is. So concurrency refers to, the ability, refers to the ability of different parts or units of a program, algorithm, or problem to be executed out of order or in partial, partial order without affecting the final outcome. So, what that means is you should be able to have parts of your program that are running simultaneously, and the order in which uh, the instructions uh, can be running can be interleaved. So I'll show a diagram to make, it, make that a bit clearer. So one of the basic fundamental ways to handle concurrency, that's provided, uh, the abstraction that, that's provided for you by many languages and operating systems, is that of a thread. So there are different types of threads. There's OS threads, which is the native kernel threads that the operating system provides you. Then there are green threads, which is like something that's implemented on the user side, uh, application runtime side, and also fibers. So I'll, I'll be talking about the, the advantages and disadvantages of each of these different types of models. So let's start with OS threads. So what OS threads allow you to do is allows you to uh, take existing, so 
people are, have been used, uh, used to programming sequentially. This instruction runs after this instruction. So now when you go to the concurrent world, they wanted to make it very easy to move to that, uh, to use that same sequential thinking in a concurrent setting as well. So they introduced this. So threads allow you to do that. So you, you have two threads which have a sequence of instructions that are running, but the order in which these instructions can be, are running can be interleaved. So you can have a couple instructions from one thread. Then, uh, in, so we're talking about a single processor executing multiple threads. So a single pro processor executing multiple threads will execute some instructions from the first thread, then we'll switch over to the second thread, executing some more instructions, and we'll switch back to the first thread, or other threads if there exists this thing. And this is what this diagram illustrates. So OS threads are primarily scheduled by the operating system. Users don't have much control over it. There's a couple of uh, syscalls it provides, but not much control. It's, threads are expensive to create and context switch. And yeah, as I said, uh, you have the thread abstraction available in almost every language, probably except for Node.js because it's a single thread, thread language, and JavaScript. So and another, uh, so another requirement of using threads is you need to be able to synchronize between multiple threads, because a lot of times you'll have uh, different uh, chunk, different points of execution accessing the same area of memory, and you have to do it in a way that keeps memory consistent. Otherwise, you'll get the dreaded concurrency bugs. So now let's uh, so now that oh let's go to another category of threads, which are the multiplex threads, meaning you map mul multiple user level threads into the kernel threads. So it's called it's typically referred to as the M to N threading model where M is typically greater than N. N is like the number of processors you have. So um, you typically use these kind of, uh, now you'd, want, want, you'd probably want to know why you'd want to use such a threading model. And the point of this is to implement asynchronous and non-blocking architectures. So what this allows you to do is say you have a web server. So a web server will, try, will process a request and send back a response, right? So what, what happens if that, in, in processing that request, it blocks on some uh, input output, say, maybe connecting to an, uh, another server, like calling an API of another, uh, another web service or something like that. So when that happens, it blocks that thread. You can't do any work until that, uh, that, that data comes through. And the problem is you can't actually accept new requests while this thread is blocked. So the point of these architectures is to allow you to handle m many requests at a time and to be able to suspend that point of execution when, it, when it's being blocked on some input output and then be able to run process another request simultaneously. So uh, even in this model, you still have to deal with synchronization. So now let's talk about green threads. So this is one implementation of the M10 threading model, and it's preemptive. What this means is that there is some application runtime that's scheduling these threads for you, and you don't have much control over when they're context switched or not. Yeah, so it's scheduled by an application runtime. And then fibers are, you could think of it as like a dual, in this case, the user has control over when to context switch that lightweight thread. Yeah, uh, so it gives, you a, uh, it gives you a bit more flexibility in exchange, uh, in exchange for it. Like, uh, like now you have to actually worry about when to context switch and when not to. So it's, it's a trade-off. So there's an alternative model, which is uh, like the event loop model, where you have a single threaded architecture and you have a single event loop that go, uh, goes through all the asynchronous methods you've registered as handlers. So uh, the ways you do it in Java and the JVM ecosystem is, net, use, uh, is using Netty. And you can also use, uh, Scala has a, a great number of libraries to handle this problem as well, like Akka and all those. And Node.js. And typically uh, you can get pretty high performance out of these kind of architectures. And the cool part is since it's a single thread, you don't have to deal with race conditions or any of that. Because uh, only, one bit of code will be running at a given time, right? So that means um, you won't have any of the conflicts with shared memory anymore. So this is great. So why, if this gives you high performance, you would pro probably want to use it for everything, right? But wait, no, it's not that simple. Because you end up getting code that looks like this. So uh, don't focus too much on the actual content of the code. Just look at like the basic structure. So what you see in the structure, it, basically it's, it's an asynchronous program that basically comp uh, counts the word occurrences. So one thing you'll notice is that the code starts branching out and goes further and further to the right. Eventually, this is a very simple program, so uh, it, it, you can at least see it on one screen. But when it becomes more complicated, 
It's going to be much, much messier than this. So in exchange for getting good performance, now you have to uh, trade off for more complicated code. So one nice way to solve that is using concept of futures and promises. So, um, so when, once you use futures and promises, then you can program it in the functional style, and you'll be able to get a nice tight code. But now you've gone from what was, uh, what was sequential code, which is a bit easier to understand, to all of this uh, craziness of functional style with flat maps and maps. So is there a way we can go back to the old nice sequential style and get the same benefits of asynchronous programs? Well, yeah. So uh, async await is a concept that was introduced in C Sharp, and now it's gone to branched off to other languages. So it's a pretty cool solution. Now you have a nice, clean, sequential program that's easy to understand and figure out what's going on. But our problems are not done yet because async await is not first class. That means you can't typically pass around async functions to other functions and, and treat them as values, you know, which is like the basic core of functional programming. So what you'll get is examples of where you think the program should compile, but actually doesn't. So, and the reason is because of, uh, the, the reason has to uh, do with how async await is actually implemented. Basically what happens is it's implemented as a state machine. Like it's a, comp uh, it's a compiler transformation. So because of that, there's so many restrictions on it. And you also get unexpected semantics sometimes, like where you should be able to abstract, abstract out that slow calc future. It turns out that actually changes the meaning. So this is not a problem with a specific implementation of async await. Like the one I'm, using, um, I'm showing as an example is the Scala's async library. It's not a problem. The library is implemented very nicely. The problem is, has nothing to do with Scala. The problem has nothing to do with like the, the way you're coding, the problem has to do with async await itself. It's a nice solution, it handles like the common case. But when you, tr when you want to abstract your code, when, when your code base becomes larger, it becomes very, very difficult. And you start having to repeat yourself over and over again. And we don't want that. So what do we want? We want to be able to have first class composable abstraction to handle this kind of asynchronous code. And we should, uh, another problem with asynchronous code is it becomes hard to debug. Because when you get an exception in like a normal sequential program, you get a nice stack trace that tells you how you, got, how you got to that exceptional step. But you lose that when you go into the asynchronous world. So another thing we want, we want to make another problem with abstractions is that they might actually uh, make your pro program go slower. So we want to make sure that this abstraction is powerful enough, but at the same time gives us good performance. So, what, so why do we want this? I already mentioned some of the reasons. We want to be able to uh, write reusable code that you can use in uh, a lot of different cases. We want to be able to iterate fast. So what happens when, when you have to write the same thing in different, different places? You can't iterate as fast, right? So uh, another thing is code becomes more complicated when you can't abstract. So uh, we also want simpler code. So uh, before we get started on the solution of how we, how we solve this in data, we'll just introduce a basic core part of the solution, which is sequenceables, which is uh, a mnemonic, mnemonic I use when I talk about monads to, uh, to make it easier to, uh, to understand what a monad actually means. Because a monad is like an abstract term, not known by many people. So like, it's easier if you talk, uh, talk about it with a term that people can relate to. Like sequenceable means something that can be sequenced, right? And that's what a monad helps you to do. So basically, what is, what is a mo I'll use monad from now on. The whole point of the sequenceable part was just to get you to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the whole point of uh, sequenceable is just to introduce that mnemonic in your head that, so you have that association, so you know what a monad means from now on. So a monad is a general purpose abstraction for handling computations that can be sequenced, okay? So another uh, colloquial term or phrase for talking about monads is programmable semicolons. So take this piece of Java code. So you see, you see each statement is, terminated by a semicolon, right? So monads are an abstraction that lets you abstract over that semicolon and actually do extra work in that termination of each statement. So monads are based in category theory, that's why they have such an opaque name. And category theory is the factory for principled, powerful, and reusable abstractions. And using monads, while monads 
well, trying to develop theories around monads does require a PhD. Using monads themselves doesn't. So also, before I continue forward, I just want to dispel some myths that are going around about monads. Things like monads are impure. They're not impure. There's nothing about monads that are impure. And about the fact that monads has something to do with side effects. Monads have nothing to do with side effects. They're just another design pattern. They're a nice, pure abstraction that you can use. And it just so happens that they're, they're typically used to model side effects in a, in, a, in a pure functional language. So what's the definition of a monad? So it's a, a monad is a, oh, that should be class actually, not instance. So uh, imagine a class over there. <laughs> so, uh, it's, so it's a type class with two methods. So for those of you who don't know what a type class is, it's like an interface in Java, except it's much, much more powerful. And so here we are defining, so monad is, so a monad is a higher kind of type, which has two operations, which is return and a bind. So this uh, two greater than and equal means bind. So the nice way to think about this is monads kind of abstract over the concept of a callback. So if you look, think of this as the core action and think of this as the callback. That's a really nice way to start thinking about what this actually means. So basically what it does is it, it provides an operation to let you sequence stuff, as you see. So it waits for the result of uh, this first action. It takes that, uh, not, then it has a co continuation. So what to do with that result and give another value. So now I'll, uh, I'll talk about the IO monad, which is the standard monad you have to use in EDA in order to do, an, do any useful stuff. So an, uh, so an action of the IO monad is a description of a computation that can return a value of type A. So this is an approximation. This is to get you started thinking about what it actually means. So you can think of it as a function that takes unit and returns. So it's a function that takes like a void argument or returns A. So this is not exactly true. Because, um, because this invalidates a lot of the assumptions in pure function programming. But there's a way to get to start to think about what this actually means. So now this, now, uh, this is an almost exact definition. It's not exact because the exact definition is much more efficient than this because this actually returns a boxed ordered pair. The exact definition doesn't. It's a lot more efficient. But basically what it does is you see this abstract type called real world. So what real world is, it's a, it's a type that the user cannot, typically when you have a type, you can usually uh, create values for that type, right? If you have int, you can declare numbers and the compiler will take it. But real world is a built-in type to the compiler that the user cannot construct. So what this allows is it allows the compiler to sequence your, uh, sequence your operations in the, in the correct way and it prevents the compiler from optimizing when it shouldn't be optimizing. So just a quick example to, uh, uh, to show how you use program in the IO monad. So a simple example of downloading processing music files. So you have a music file type, which is just a string of bytes, and then you have a couple functions. So download music file takes a string and returns a music, uh, returns a music file in the IO monad, which means it's going to transform real world. It's going to return a new value of real, real world after you execute this function. And then you have another, another function called uh, merge music files too. So it'll merge the two music files to this, fi uh, it'll combine them to one file and then save them to some uh, someplace on our operating system. So now you, all we know about the IO monad is that's a monad. So if it's a monad, we can use these methods, right? So what, what can, uh, so let's say we, we have two music files and we want a one dot mp3 and two dot mp3. We want to merge it. So this is how you'd write it. And this, this style of programming should actually look very familiar, just like callbacks, just like we saw earlier in this call example. And as you see it, just like with callbacks, it's going to keep on uh, expanding to the right and making it harder to read. So because it's such a common problem and because monads are used so much in languages like Haskell and Ada, there's a thing called do notation. And you can think of this as like the most general form of async await. So async await is like a special case of do notation. So, so these, two, uh, these two pieces of code are actually identical. The only difference is this one's written in the standard uh, imperative sequential style, so it's easier to understand what's going on. 
So if you look at this code, it's very easy to see that, okay, you're downloading a, uh, downloading a music file, you get two songs, and then you're gonna, you're gonna pass it as arguments to the next function to get the result. It's a lot easier to reason about. So now let's talk about how we uh, got, got around to implementing fibers in IDA. So uh, the concurrency story for IDA has been a bit tricky for a long time. So um, Haskell uses green threads, and implementing green threads on the JVM is a very difficult task. So, uh, and it, sometimes it can interfere with JIT optimizations, and there's all sorts of problems with it. So we've been struggling with how we get a nice lightweight thread solution on the JVM for a long time. And we always assumed it would be something at the compiler or runtime system level. And with, uh, with the right inspiration, we were able to find a solution that actually uh, provides a fiber implementation in, at, in the language level itself with some runtime extensions. So it all started, so we have a Gitter channel for Ida, and it all started when uh, a guy named Alberto said this one thing. So Alberto, uh, I'll introduce him later, he's the author of uh, the Transient Framework. It's a framework for doing reactive, uh, reactive programming in Haskell. And it has a very uh, interesting implementation. So basically, he, uh, he basically made this comment. He's like, I was fantasizing about a base IO plus monad, which makes the continu continuation available for the programmer, so a lot of effects may, can be created, including threading. So there's something about what he said that instantly sparked a light bulb, and I started hacking. So right, like this was, I think on like a Wednesday or Thursday, and by that weekend, I had a working implementation of Fibers. So yeah, this is, uh, you can find out information about Alberto here. Um, yeah, and I just wanna uh, briefly uh, show some of the power of uh, the framework that he built. So, the cool, uh, so this is uh, an example of a distributed program written in like what, six lines? What it does is, uh, so it has two core primitives called wormhole and teleport. So wormhole creates a gateway into another machine. So in this case, the machine is referred to as node. And in, inside the machine, these, uh, these instructions get run. So, uh, can everybody see this, by the way? Okay. So, in, so in, in the node machine, we are doing hello world in node. We grab the process ID, and then we teleport. So what teleport does is it now brings you back to the current machine. So wormhole hole creates that gate, and you're on the other side. And when you do teleport, you come back to the original side and you can continue programming. So the cool part about this is that it allows you to program distributed systems, especially distributed system protocols, in a, sequen in a sequential style. So we wanted to get something like this inside of Ida, but the only problem is this requires a lightweight threading system to work very nicely. So that's when you came up with the concept of a fiber monad. So it's a monad for working with computations that can suspend at any time. So it's actually, in terms of implementation-wise, it's actually exactly like the IO monad, but the only difference is the bind implementation. So the bind implementation, what it does is it maintains a continu continuation stack. And this stack is very efficient because we made it, uh, we represented it using an efficient, mutable Java array. So now when, when I say the word mutable, it's gonna raise red flags with everybody, every one of you, it should. But, and the, the thing is, uh, if you actually look into it, it actually works out. It won't cause any major semantic problems. And it becomes very efficient. So this is the basic interface, the monadic interface. So it gives you a return, which takes a pure value and, and puts in the fiber monad. And then a bind, which allows you to sequence fiber computations. And then uh, there are some other instances you have. So I don't have time to talk about these other abstractions like functor, applicative, and alternative. Just, uh, I just put basic comments on what, the, what it does. So a functor lets you transform, transform the output of a computation. An applicative allows you to paralyze. So in this particular case, you actually do paralyze the computation. So uh, this allows you to uh, spin off fibers that do parallel computations and come back with a compound result. And there's also an alternative instance, which means uh, if the first fiber fails, it'll automatically run the second fiber. And there's also two more primitives. Uh, so these are uh, these two primitives uh, that are down here, yield and block. So these are like the very low level primitives that allow you to construct all sorts of concurrency models you want. So yield, what it does is it terminates, terminates the current uh, computation at that point and it'll automatically add, uh, add the, uh, 
the remaining computation to run Q. And then block is a simpler version of yield that doesn't do that uh, part where it adds it to the global run queue. So I'll talk about this stuff when I get to the second half of my talk where I talk about the internals. But just know yield that, okay, go ahead. Yeah, on the temp, the temp. Attempt? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's gonna be in the future work, but yeah, it, it's possible. But we haven't done it yet, yeah. It definitely will be there though. So now how do you spawn a fiber? So we provide a fork fiber primitive that, let, that, give, uh, you, that you send a fiber computation and it'll run it in the IO monad. And, and let's talk very quickly about MVARs. So MVARs, you can think of them as a single element bounded channel. So what that means is, it can only carry one element at a time. And let's say the channel has an element. If you want to add a new element to, uh, into this MVAR, the operation will block. So we already have these operations in the IO monad and Edo, and it'll actually block the current thread, which uh, won't give you as much uh, throughput. But we actually provide implementations of the operations in the fiber monad. And the cool part is in the fiber monad, it's actually non-blocking. So it actually terminates that thread and allows other threads to run. And here's a very uh, simple example of using the basic stuff of injury so far, basic fiber APIs and, uh, and uh, MVARs. So basically what, what this program does, it's, uh, so it creates two fibers, and this fiber, uh, fiber will say ping, and it'll send a message to the other one, and this, uh, this fiber will respond and say pong. And it'll keep on going, it'll, it'll keep a counter of, of what's going on. So uh, this is the core, f uh, core function. So what it does, uh, it takes a source channel, so a source MVAR and a sync MVAR. So the source is input, input to this fiber, and the sync is the output. So basically these two fibers are connected in like, a, in, like a, in like a cycle. So this fiber, the input of this fiber is connected to the other one, and the input of that fiber is connected to this one, and the output. So it's connected in a circle. So what it does, uh, so it'll, it'll try to grab some input, and if no input is available, it'll just stop the thread and allow other threads to run. So this is actually non-blocking. And the cool part is, so now you get, you get asynchronous computation. So this is non-blocking, but you can just, now you don't, you don't know the difference. Like in other languages, where there's async await and that kind of stuff, you'll see an async keyword that says, okay, this is not, uh, like this is non-blocking. But here you can distinguish. It's because, it's because of the power of the abstraction we've, we, we've done with this. So the only way you can distinguish between asynchronous and synchronous in, uh, in this model is through types. If it's in fiber, it's most likely gonna be non-blocking. If it's in IO, it's going to be blocking. That's the way you distinguish. So it, it just prints a message, and then it'll, uh, it'll just send like an empty uh, m a unit, unit value to the other uh, fiber, and then it'll increment. So it'll go in like an, uh, almost like an infinite loop. So here's the main function that runs this example. So what, what I've done here, so this is what tells a runtime system to only use one thread. So the runtime system, either runtime system is pretty configurable, you can configure how big your thread pool is and all that kind of stuff. So in this case, we're, we're config, uh, configuring it to one thread. And this is to actually demonstrate this is actually non-blocking. All these operations are non-blocking because then you'll see stuff always happening. So now uh, this is basic initialization stuff, you fork two fibers. And then on the main thread, you have, uh, you have, uh, huh, in the main thread you start. So you, you activate this fiber in, uh, in the main thread here, and then you wait about a second and see how, how far it goes. So I'm going, to, so what I'll do is I'll run that example so you guys can see it. So as you can see, it's alternating. And I've cut it off at one second, so it'll go on forever, but yeah. I've cut it out one second so you can at least, the program terminates. Okay, so the cool part about this is it allows you to code asynchronous code like it's synchronous without having to work with, uh, worry about extra syntax overhead like async or await or any of that. So after seeing all this, you probably understood that fibers are the fundamental primitives with which you can implement efficient concurrency mechanisms. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you can build with, with fibers now. So now you can build actors on top of this. You can build reactors. So 
There's an alternative concurrency model, model called, the, called the, the join calculus. It's a purely functional concurrency model. So I've, I've just colloquialized that to reactor because it, it, kind of, it kind of gives you intuition as to how it works. It allows you to program reactive systems. It allows you to do non-blocking IO applications. So I haven't, I haven't actually shown you the primitives to handle non-blocking and all that stuff. We have to, we're st this is still in under development, but we can uh, get that done eventually. And you can also just use it for simple asynchronous tests. Let's say you're trying to download, you're crawling, you're, you're writing a crawler, and you want to, you want to um, like download HTML files from multiple websites. You could program some stuff like that as well. So now I'll talk a little bit about where this is going to go and uh, what kind of APIs we're going to add eventually. So an API to uh, convert callback-based Java APIs to Fibred APIs. So this allows you. So many many Java APIs have uh, uh, take handlers once it, once a result happens. So you want to be able to use these APIs in this new Fiber monad, right? So we're going to provide permits for that. We're going to support Java.utila concurrent future. So almost so many libraries use this. Uh, Use the, use the standard, uh, Java's standard fu uh, future data type. And so we want to be, uh, have a way to integrate the future mechanism inside of fibers to make sure that uh, non-blocking uh, non promise stays. So in EDA, we currently have software transactional memory, but um, it blocks. So if, like, a uh, if like, uh, the conditions of a transaction don't hold or you're doing a retry, then it'll actually block the current thread instead of letting other transactions run. So we're going to have a Fiber API for so software transactional memory as well. And uh, as you asked, there, there's going to be an API for catching exceptions as well. So it'll just be like catching exceptions in like a normal sequential I.O. program, except it'll now take into account the fact that it's asynchronous. And then uh, another thing we want to do is we want to uh, get the applic applicative do extension from GAC8. So that what that does is, so as I showed before, the applicative API for fiber actually paralyzes the fibers. So what, what, what would happen is, say something like, uh, take something like this API back here. Uh, so, uh, take for, uh, for a second, uh, replace this um, IO with fiber. So assume this is, a, this is a fiber computation. So what applicative do will do is actually convert this to an applicative expression and automatically paralyze it. So, to the user, it looks like you're just sequentially doing stuff, right? But it'll actually automatically find the most efficient way to uh, do the computation, which is, in this case, to parallelize these two because they don't depend on each other. So that's another direction we want to take for it. We have to be able to handle blocking calls. So any asynchronous system has this threat of a call that actually blocks and just uh, cripples the system. So we need a way to fork off blocking calls into a separate thread pool and then just be able to wait on it. And then now, uh, remember the wormhole, wormhole and uh, teleport examples I gave you? So that, that's the uh, distributed systems angle of it. So we want to be able to support that API as well. We want to be able to implement wormhole and teleport inside of EDA using fibers as like the core. So and we want to add some mechanism fault tolerance. So basically this exception API in the distributed setting what we can have it do is we can have it uh, an exception thrown in Another system can actually propagate back up to the original system, giving you a nice fault tol tolerant mechanism. So, and yeah, and the transient library has lots of other really cool APIs. You guys should check it out. And also, there's another aspect of uh, we want to address, which is the tooling. So, a big problem in asynchronous uh, using asynchronous frameworks is being able to debug when something goes wrong. So, uh, how fibers are implemented right now is whenever you yield, it actually sends an exception, and that exception captures the stack trace of your program. So actually, uh, what we can do is we can actually make a simple Java agent that actually uh, captures a stack trace and then gives you the entire sequence. So you'll know exactly what happened each time your fiber was running. You'll know exactly, yeah? So the performance So actually, uh, yeah, that's why it's a Java agent. So the standard one, actually, I've turned off stack traces to, for performance reasons. But yeah, this Java agent will turn it on and then it'll, re it'll do a bit of rewriting to turn on that, uh, the stack trace capturing so that you can actually get nice debugging stuff. That's why it's a Java agent. <laughs> yeah. So uh, currently, the development of fi EDA Fibers is going on in a separate repo called EDA Fibers Dev. And the cool part is we're able to implement this completely as a library without many runtime, runtime extensions. And the reason is there's a concept called uh, for, uh, foreign primitive operations in EDA. 
So it allows you to extend the runtime system using Java. So you can write some Java methods to extend the runtime system. Uh, so this allows you to program all sorts of primitives that you want and make interop easier. So right now it says it's a separate library, but eventually we're gonna include this inside of like the standard library. We still have to figure out the standard library story because now we have an issue of Haskell's, Haskell's base and Ada's base. We have to figure, out, figure that out, but eventually whatever standard library we have, it's going to be in there eventually. So th these are just some basic instructions if you wanna play around it, like I'll upload these slides. So now this is the second half of the talk. I'm going to be talking about the performance aspect of these fibers. So th this is a nice API. It, it, it's a lot cleaner to deal with in async await, but at the end of the day, if it can give you the performance you need, which, you, you program asynchronous in the first place to get performance. If you don't get the performance, then you're not gonna use this in the first place, right? So I'm going to talk about uh, how I was able to optimize this down to really tolerable speeds. <laughs> So in order to understand uh, the performance aspects of this, I'm gonna uh, cover three components. Uh, let me just check. Okay, so uh, I'll cover the ETA runtime, the hotspot JIT compiler, and now the benchmark I ran to actually test how fast these things were. So just a quick overview, overview of the ETA runtime. It has a concept called capabilities, which are execution contexts that can run lazy functional programs. This is similar to how uh, GSC does it, but the semantics are slightly different. And uh, so you can effectively think of a capability as being attached to an OS level thread. So you can think of it effectively as an OS thread. And you also have uh, what, what are called thread state objects, which are light, they're just Java objects that contain all the information about an execution. And you have a, so now uh, the runtime system of EDA is actually a bit different than how uh, GSC handles concurrency. So we have what's called, what it's called a global run queue. It's a work stealing deck so you have, you can imagine it as a bunch of capabilities. Say you have four capabilities, and you have this uh, work stealing deck. So what happens is each capability as it's running its code might add stuff to this work, work stealing deck, and the other, other capabilities that are not doing anything will start grabbing TSOs from, uh, fr from that. So the, way, the reason we have to do this is to avoid doing checkpoints in normal user code, because in order to do work pushing, you need to be able to do checkpoints at some point in your code to, push, uh, to know when you have work to push. So yeah, as I said before, the year run time is pretty configurable. You can configure how long you wait before you pull something around the queue. There's lots of configurable tool parameters, but we just haven't gotten around to documenting them yet. We'll get around to it. Um, so now let's look at the JIT compilation aspect. So what JIT compilation does, so how it works is you have JVM bytecodes and they get interpreted at runtime. And then what'll happen is, uh, it'll, as you interpret the code, you'll learn, uh, the JIT compiler will, will learn how, what, uh, what code is being run the most and what's causing the performance bottlenecks, and it'll optimize those. So these are called hot methods. So, so the uh, methods that are being run the most are called hot methods, and uh, they'll be optimized and inline by the JIT. And JIT can also de-optimize. So let's say it assumes that a certain structure of your code, and it turns out those assumptions are wrong later on in your program. It'll de-optimize, and then uh, optimize it again. So there's also a thing, uh, so there's also different levels of JIT compilers, especially when you talk about Hotspot, which is Oracle's uh, JIT compiler. So, um, so there's C1 and C2. C1 is called the client server, uh, client compiler. So it does like, uh, so the code, it the assembly code it generates is, uh, is just okay. And C2 does more aggressive optimization. So I'll just cover like very briefly some of the kind of optimizations the JIT can do. So there's one thing called null check and elimination. So these are very common in Java code where you check whether something is null before you execute a method on it. So what, it, what it'll do is it actually take out that branch altogether and it'll just call the method directly and it will install a thing called uncommon trap so that when a null, null pointer exception actually does happen, it'll, that trap will catch it and it'll de-optimize the code. There's also branch prediction. So what will happen is, <laughs> Let's assume that this branch is the only branch that, get, that gets taken in your program. For whatever reason, that's the only branch that, get, that gets taken care of for a given period of time in your program. What the JIT will do is, it, is actually take out the other branch com completely. So all you have, instead of even doing a branch, it'll just directly go to this code, making it very, very efficient, avoiding a branch. But at the same time, just like before, you'll have an uncommon trap, and uh, by, if by chance the other branch gets taken at some point in the future, it'll de-optimize, and then do a different optimization. So when, when both branches are being, taken, uh, are being taken, it'll figure out which branch has more frequency, 
and, and make that the standard and avoid that extra branch that happens when trying to arrive, arrive there. And then inlining, this is like the mother of all the optimizations that JIT does, and has many parameters to uh, tune it. So I won't uh, go too much into it, but these are the two most important ones, which is max inline size and freak inline size. So max inline size is the maximum si bytecode size of a method uh, before which JIT will just stop inlining it. And freak inline size is when you have a hot method, what's the maximum limit before uh, it doesn't inline? So this is a way you can get, so these values are actually platform dependent, and uh, you can get them using these flags. Again, I'll pull the slides so you can try it offline. And there's one more uh, cool optimization it does, which is type profiling. So uh, interface methods and uh, virtual methods. So the problem with these is that you can have many implementations of a given interface, you can have many implementations of a given like, uh, class. So what'll happen is, they'll actually have to do a, a lookup and verification every time it, it tries to run a method. So uh, what the optimization can do, it does a thing called type profiling. It'll check what types are, so it'll evaluate what are all the types that get passed to X. And if it's just a single type all the time, it'll actually inline the method, uh, that specific implementation directly, making it a lot, uh, making, it, making the performance a lot better. And it does the same thing for virtual methods as well. Same thing happens, so let's say another type comes along. So there's a concept called bimorphic uh, call sites and all this stuff, I won't go into that, but the uh, basic point is it'll de-optimize and re-optimize again. So and now let's talk about the thread ring be benchmark. So this is what I used to measure how fast EDA fibers were with respect to the other alternatives on the JVM. So basically what it does is it measures context switch time. And in this particular bench, so basically how it works this benchmark, you have like a bunch of threads and uh, you start it by passing a message to one of the threads, and it'll send that message around in, in, that, in that loop. As many times it's required to reduce the value of the message to zero. In this case, the value of the message is one million. So you're gonna be passing that message around one million times in this ring of size 500. So this really stresses the context switch aspect of any threading implementation. So, uh, so it's the, the benchmark is uploaded on GitHub, so you guys can run it on your own machines, and uh, it's, uh, it's done using the Java micro benchmark. So actually this uh, benchmark was already done by some other guy. And uh, so I forked from him and added the EDA implementation as well as uh, Vertex just to compare. So, so here's the result of the benchmark. So, so Akka takes around, around seven, uh, 650 uh, milliseconds. EDA fibers take around 950. So the performance difference is around 1.5. Now it makes sense because Akka is specialized for actors, and actors have a specific structure, right? So they can be optimized, so Akka would be designed to optimize that kind of structure. And fibers are more general, you can build like anything out of fibers. So I guess taking a 1.5 performance hit with, uh, in exchange for flexibility is not a, bad, not a bad thing. And the interesting part here is, so how many, have you, how many of you have heard of Quasar? So it's this uh, library uh, it's this JVM library that, that does bytecode uh, generation at runtime that adds code to, uh, uh, to allow you to suspend any Java method. So the interesting part about this is that EDA fibers are, are able to get the same performance as the bytecode generation method. And in our case, we don't do any bytecode generation. Uh, we get our performance for, through compile time uh, optimizations that are done on the code. So now we'll try to analyze a little bit. So we'll look a bit deeper in the results. So this is how the, so how JMH works is that it runs many iterations to take into account uh, that uh, JIT optimizations happen over time. So if you look, in the warm-up iteration, it took around six seconds actually in the beginning, and they got very fast. And if you look at EDA, the start time is actually a lot faster, almost three times faster, but then it optimized down, but not as much as, as, uh, as Akka did. And actually, part, I'll discuss uh, to the reason as to why this happened. Part of it has to do with lazy evaluation. So, um, so here's, an, uh, here's a way to look at what was actually being inlined. So uh, if you send these, create, uh, these fl three flags to uh, Java when you execute your program, you actually get a nice trace of all the methods that are optimized uh, during your program. And uh, so here's the trace. So I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly zip through this. So this, is one, this was on the hot methods. So this was a method that actually uh, did the logic of checking whether um, 
checking whether, uh, decrementing the message value and sending it to the next, uh, type, next uh, thread. So in here's like a deep, decompiled uh, form of that method. So yeah, so this set current C, push next, and all this is the part that maintains the continuation stack in the fiber Fiber monad. And yeah, that's it. So Eta fibers give you a composable solution, composable alternative to the async await problem. It's in performance, it's not bad. It's almost as uh, as good as quasar fibers. And conclusion is, another conclusion is, lazy FP in the JM is actually not as slow as people think it is. It's actually pretty fast. It's just a matter of time, actually. Continuing, continuing working on making it better and better. And that's it. Oh, before I get started, so if you want to get involved in like the development of EDA and just uh, keep up with what's going on, we have a Gitter channel. That's the most active thing, channel. Twitter's also pretty active, and we have Google, Google Groups if you want to do an asynchronous discussion. And yeah, thanks. So like, I guess you could say most of the bind implementation is in Java. Like you can't, like because it's it's working with mutable arrays, right? Mutable, it's a mutable continuation stack, and also has to interact with the runtime system. Being able to push to the glo that global run queue I was talking about, you have to be able to push to that, right? When you yield. So taking care of all that logic has to be done on the Java side, because the, because the runtime itself is written in Java, right? So, but yeah, you could eventually make it all on the either side as well if you provide more primitives. So I guess I guess it's similar to that only, but the only difference is like that uh, Haskell has green test by default, so they don't have to deal with any of these problems. <laughs> this is a JVM language, so you have to deal with that kind of stuff. You do actually. Oh, I think I, that was a bad. That fork fiber actually returns a thread ID. Yeah, it returns a thread ID. I'll fix that when I, before I play. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is not this is you don't have to think of it as something new. This is just a way to get that green thread functionality from Haskell onto JVM, <laughs> without all the overhead. You know, yeah. So, so I personally just used Haskell mode <laughs> on Emacs. So. Yeah, but yeah, we are working on, so currently we have a guy working part-time on building the IntelliJ plugin for EDA. So it is being worked on. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is probably not practice, but yeah. is there a timeline on all the code stuff will be available? Uh, <laughs> because I, I have projects that, that sort of cover this. Oh, okay. So we'll talk about that offline. Right. But m uh, the timeline, right, okay, okay, so I'll just discuss what we're going to prioritize right now. So main Priority right now is focusing on the user side, like getting right, nice documentations up for all these patched libraries and getting um, nice tutorials written and developing this fiber API further. Right. And also, uh, we want to uh, support template Haskell, which is like, it's going to take some time, so we want to get it done as soon as possible. And yeah, we're focused on those kind of things and more li getting more libraries supported. That's the current priority right now. So Firebridge, we haven't figured out where, where it fits in yet, sure. but yeah, we're, we're probably gonna spend at least a day on it a week <laughs> and gradually build it up, but we have lots of things to do, so it's a small team, so. Do you have any overhead? Uh, how many fibers do you have? Um, I haven't actually tried, but I, I think you can have quite a, quite a lot. Probably, given the fact that the context switching time is as much as Quasar, whatever Quasar can get, you could probably get the same amount. Uh, yeah, more or less the same amount, yeah. This. So this is 650 milliseconds to switch fibers one million times. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs>